Ten years ago, our nation's capital was ravaged by one of the country's worst fires. Four lives were lost and over 500 homes. But the extent of the devastation caused by the Canberra fires baffled scientists and emergency services. It was a, a pretty big shock because, I mean, there's, there's nothing really in the literature which suggests the fire should spread that fast or could spread that fast. In the aftermath, it was clear that the worst damage was due to something much more savage than an ordinary firestorm. There was a police car that was picked off the ground and dumped into a stormwater drain. There was a series of streets in the southern edge of Chapman which had suffered severe wind damage as well as fire damage and that was difficult to explain. What hit Canberra had never before been documented in science. Holy shit. A fire tornado. On January the 8th, 2003, a huge dry lightning storm struck in multiple places across the ACT, sparking a large number of fires. One of the biggest began here in the Brindabella Ranges. But for days, fire conditions weren't particularly alarming. A very orderly fire behaviour, a very orderly progression across the landscape. Then, on the 18th of January, the situation turned catastrophic. Dry westerly winds came into play. Temperatures reached 37 degrees, causing surface air to mix with the upper atmosphere, creating strong gusts. So the fire started over there in the valley. It steadily moved along that ridge until it got to a point into fresh fuel and this whole area was ignited within about 20 minutes. This whole area this was This whole alight. area was alight. At that stage, it was perhaps the biggest fire event that this area had seen for quite a long time. Stephen Wilkes was in a chopper at 2pm that day, mapping the fire. I was trying very hard to find out where the front of the fire was to give us an idea of how fast it was coming into town, and there was no front. The fire had broken up into thousands of smaller fires we were seeing things that none of us had ever seen, knowing things were wrong, but not being able to make any sense of it. Suddenly, it all went quiet, and the chopper pilot turned to me and said, Steve, I don't think we're going to get out of here. And I looked around, and I realised that if I panicked at all, I was probably dead. As we left, I took a photograph of what I saw was a, a slight rotation and some light coming through the plume, and we believe that was pretty close prior to the, the tornado forming. To be honest with you, I've only recently um, realised how lucky I was. The next day, Stephen returned to document the damage. We were speechless, we were devastated. The houses that were alight and wind damage that was done. There were massive trees, fully mature yellow box trees, just torn up out of the ground, moved a few metres and dumped. What kept coming to my mind was a tornado. In the science literature, fire tornadoes didn't exist. But as researchers slowly pieced together information from aerial and ground surveys, no other explanation fit. This is the damage path that was mapped from the air soon after the event, and it shows it extending from around Mount Koree through to the suburb of Kambar. That looks like a, quite a long path. It extends a total of 25 kilometres. It was just under half a kilometre in width before it hit the city. Whatever ripped through the suburb of Chapman hit the Pierce Pine Plantation first. Amidst the blackened trunks, it left a distinctive trail of destruction. The trees had all been snapped off at about three metres above the ground. The alignment of the trees left lying on the ground was indicative of a vortex. Softwood trees, like pines, can only snap off when wind speeds reach a level equivalent to two on the Fujita scale of tornado intensity, the highest being five. At this strength, Trees can be uprooted, cars lifted off the ground, and roofs torn off. 
dropped all of this supported our claim that the wind speeds were around 250 kilometres per hour. But ironically, the real clincher was areas where there was no damage at all. The key part of it is the fact that these gaps are in here. A tornado is able to lift off from the ground and reattach later, and these gaps support the notion that it is a tornado. The alternate hypothesis, a fire whirl, isn't able to lift off from the ground. It's attached to the hot fire ground. As the evidence came together, extraordinary images emerged of the tornado itself, so, yeah, right. helping to define the characteristics of the, the vortex. Of the tornado in the photo corresponds to about two centimetres, so that means that the base of the tornado must have been about half a kilometre wide there. Half a kilometre, that's amazing. It's 4pm in Kambar district playing fields, a very different looking afternoon to when Tom Bates stood here watching the fire roar over the hill. So where did you first see the tornado coming? Well, on Mount Arrowing here. It arced across the top of the hill. Spot fires along the bottom. Yeah. Stood up on this side as it was just like a great big wave ready to burst. Incredibly, Tom caught the moment on film. I've never in my life seen anything like it. Holy mackerel. At the far right, the funnel of the tornado comes into view. This is rather frightening. Oh, I get pitted with stuff. Stinging the daylights out. Sheets of tin floating. You near it in the camera. Power line going there. No one has captured a tornado like that as clearly in a fire situation before. One of the interesting things about the video was a pair of football goalposts in the foreground. And that gave us a measurement stick in the vertical direction so we could go out to where the video was taken and we could measure the speed of movement over the ground and also the wind speeds within the vortex. We were able to estimate a vertical wind speed of over 150 kilometres per hour. Scientifically documenting a fire tornado was a world first. But that left a vital and more important research question. How could a series of relatively contained fires develop so quickly into such a violent pyroconvective event? I guess I was really interested in um, trying to understand what caused the thunderstorm which spawned the tornado. In the multispectral line scans taken on the day, Dr Jason Sharples was struck with the same puzzling images again and again sections of the fire spreading sideways. Well, these are instances where the fire, where it would normally be spreading downwind, have started actually spreading across wind. And what we found were that these instances, without exception, were connected with lee-facing slopes. I'm on a lee-facing slope, facing away from hot westerly winds. Normally, these are considered the sheltered sides, the safest areas to take cover from a fire. But in the case of the Canberra fires, it was these slopes that burnt the fastest and the most intensely. Framed a hypothesis that this, uh, this phenomenon was being caused by the interaction between the fire, the wind and the terrain. So what we did in Portugal was to try and emulate these conditions in a combustion tunnel. In the experiments, the fire behaved exactly as it did in Canberra, racing up the lee slope and channeling sideways as it hit the headwind. Multiple spot fires were created, igniting large tracts of the slope. Before these experiments confirmed it, no one knew a fire could behave in this way. Here's what's going on. The wind travels upslope, but as it hits the crest, it's moving too fast to follow the terrain and lifts off, swirling back on itself in an eddy. The fire moves with it, and the disastrous result is that two sides of the hill light up at the same time with extraordinary speed. It turns a small fire into a very big fire very quickly. Rather than spread in, in a, as a fire front, as it normally would, it causes what we call deep flaming. So that's where you get large tracts of the landscape all igniting in a relatively short amount of time. The intense and deep flaming caused by the fire channeling events happened immediately before the thunderstorm formed. 
With such a huge area of light, a massive amount of energy was released into the atmosphere. In fact, in the peak 10 minutes of flaming, more energy was released than the Hiroshima atomic bomb. The massive smoke plume of heat and moisture formed a gigantic pyrocumulonimbus cloud, a huge supercell thunderstorm. Stephen took these incredible photographs as it formed. As the moist, hot fire plume is lifted into the upper atmosphere, it's hit by upper-level winds of a different speed and direction, setting up a vortex, and a tornado is born. As for fire tornadoes, the team hopes never to see another one. But they're even more hopeful that their discoveries on fire behaviour may one day save lives. When it comes to an extreme fire, we have learned an awful lot about how to stay safe and how to protect the community. The real challenge now is getting those learnings out right across the bushfire industry.